uh, have been on these presentations before. We really appreciate you joining in today. We're really excited because we have uh, our second time we've had a Barnhart crane rigging representative uh, guest speaking. And today, uh, Gene Kerker, a PhD, he's a director of quality and safety at Barnhart. Uh, and he's going to be presenting on the tackling the challenges of training site supervisors, lift directors, and other leaders. So I'm going to get out of my email here in a minute, but um, let's go. Let's just dive in really quick. ITI, we basically, if you're not familiar with us, we are a training company. What's really interesting, uh, we train rigging and load handling and cranes and rigging uh, in a bevy of different industry groups. And what's what's really neat about uh, Barnhart, our training center in Memphis is actually at the Barnhart facility. Uh, and they use it for their internal training. And Gene's going to touch on a lot about uh, training today, obviously. So we serve a lot of the same markets and customer bases, uh, ITI in the education space and Barnhart in the heavy load lifting and transport space. So uh, one thing I we didn't we left a slide out on this presentation, but one thing I want to make sure you all know is you'll have the recording available after this available to you. And this uh, presentation file actually will be available. And actually, at that same web page, you'll be able to access all the past presentations. And just want to give you a heads up on the upcoming presentations that are uh, here in the future. So uh, today, we also have Mike Parnell on the call. He's going to be helping out with Q&A and just uh, listening in. And uh, as a lot of you know, he's um, our president and CEO of ITI, a very, very well-known expert in wire rope and rigging in the industry. Um, and then Gene, again, uh, PhD, Director of Safety and Quality at Barnhart. Uh, we, he actually gave this presentation at a crane rigging conference in New Orleans. I think it was back in April or uh, spring, anyways, Gene. And uh, it was very, very well received. I, I actually attended uh, about half of it because we had a presentation we were running at the same time. But uh, without further ado, Gene, I just want to turn it over to you, I'll let you jump into this, and I'm looking forward to the presentation. Very good. Let me just bring this up, everybody. Thank you, uh, ITI, and for Mike and Zach for the opportunity. It is our privilege to uh, to present this. Make sure everybody can see that. Zach, are we good? Yep, we're good. All right. Um, as I dive into this, let me just start by this. We all want our jobs to to end like this. The the vessel is set. Uh, it looks great and uh, no issues. Uh, we, we we do not. We are not like this, where situations occur. Uh, obviously, uh, personal injury is of most importance, but also obviously the cost of uh, equipment, capital, reputation, and just the future business is at risk. And so, the the challenge before us is really tackling the challenges of training uh, our field leaders, our site supervisors, lift directors, and, and other leaders, since they are the people that are actually in the field executing this work. And the, the key here, or the key words, is training. What I want to discuss over the next uh, roughly 45 minutes are the key points here. I want to go through the why of training. Uh, this is more of a little bit of philosophy uh, as to Barnhart's philosophy on training. Uh, how and who we define as field leaders. Uh, the skills that these leaders require uh, how both standards and regulations have impacted our ability to, to find people, uh, both in, in positive and, I would say, in somewhat constricting manners. Uh, and then the pipeline of people, uh, how do we find them? And then, then the, finally, the qualifications and the training needs of these leaders and some final thoughts. That's kind of the flow. So let me get into the why of training. This is um, kind of a... Why do we train? Um, some we can probably go through, and a lot of us would have um, probably similar answers. It could be compliance to the law. It could be because we want to be competitive in the marketplace, and we want to to, to be the best. It may be um, well, we have to train our people because we have to provide quality service to our customers. Um, maybe it's because we want to be excellent, and we want all of our people uh, to to be. Uh, that same caliber, or there may be a general statement as um, to be safe. The question I want to ask is, uh, what does it mean? What does it mean to be safe? What does it mean? Um, what does the word mean? This is not always 
uh, an easy word to define, and I think it's sometimes kind of like art. A lot of times you, you know what you, you don't like, but you're not too sure if you can describe what you like. So I think a lot of us would say, yeah, uh, safe, does it mean to be safe? Uh, zero acts, misses, injuries, first aids, the whole zero concept. Um, I'm going to propose that all of these are really the results of working safely. Uh, they're not really a definition of safety in themselves. Um, those, those are the, those are the, the actions of, of being safe. So our goal is obviously to have zero injuries, but I want to say this, is that in, 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 our, in our vernacular, compliance to regulations is, is not always, does not always imply safe operations. Okay? It's not to say that we're not compliant. It's not to say that we do not follow regulations. But just because rules are followed, just because procedures are followed, does not mean that you will necessarily have the goal that you desire. So again, uh, what does it mean to be safe? I wanted to define, here's our working definition. We define safety as working within an acceptable level of risk. Um, we, as a crane and rigging company, we actually desire risk. We know that our customers hire us um, to transfer risk. Uh, many of our large customers in uh, the heavy industry definitely have the capital necessary to, to, to buy the equipment, to hire people, um, but you still have the skill and expertise. And so we're, we are hired to essentially minimize their risk, their exposure. And so we want risk, but what is the acceptableness? Um, that's the key. I would say risk, in this case, is a threat of damage, injury, liability, or other loss that's caused by external and internal uh, vulnerabilities. The key here is it may be minimized through preemptive action. Okay. So safety, then, is a proactive term. It's, it's not a reactive. Um, it's, it's very much a, an active form. And leaders, both in, the, in leaders in business and leaders in our field, our field leaders, they must manage the risks that they're exposed to. And, there, and thereby making that risk acceptable and making our job safe. So in essence, it needs to be safe to properly manage risk. To be risk managers is to be safe. Now, I really want to review what, it, what this risk-based safety, as we're calling it, as opposed to compliance-based safety, what it is not. Uh, number one, uh, we are not implying that it's risky. Okay? Um, we want risk, we want a lot of risk, but we want to, to, obviously from a business perspective, we want to price for it and get paid for it, but we want to manage it. It does not mean that it's a disregard for standards and regulations, uh, by no means. We, we think uh, standards, uh, industrial standards are, are good, they're best practices. Uh, regulations um, can be good, obviously OSHA I think has a place, but it's more of a, an intent, it's a philosophy, that it's not just because you are following these regulations that you're going to execute well, but it's because you're managing the risk, and part of managing risk is doing the right thing. And so that would be following regulations at times. And then third, it doesn't mean you're checking your brain at the door. It is a proactive, it's a thinking, it is entirely, uh, requires the entire involvement of our crews uh, from a field leaders down to the newest guy that we bring on the job site. So the why of training. Um, we want to ensure that our employees are obviously certified and qualified to operate our equipment. We want them to, uh, to meet our regulatory, regulatory requirements. And we want them to meet our customers' expectations. We want them to minimize, because of their training, minimize property damage because they know what to look for, they know how to manage the risk, the things that always change in a job site. Um, similarly, in minimizing personal injury, we definitely want all of our men uh, to go home uh, safely and in good shape, maybe tired, but uh, definitely in good shape and ready to come back to work the next morning. But we're also a for-profit business, and uh, we want to maximize our efficiency, and we want to maximize our profitability. And really, then our goal then, taking into account our, our, uh, the goal of safe, being safe, meaning we are managing risk, 
is the ultimate goal of our training, the why of training, is to teach employees how to assess and mitigate risk. That is, we need our field leaders to be risk managers. Even though they may not have the title, we want them to manage risk. And many of them may not even know that, that they're actually assessing and mitigating. Um, but we really want our, our, our men to think through three questions. What could go wrong? That's really the, what are the risks? Um, how, how bad could it be? Uh, the probability of something going wrong. And then finally, what am I going to do about it? These three questions really sum up risk management. And so if our men are thinking in the field constantly at all levels, with, at whatever their sphere of influence is, what could go wrong? How bad could it be? And what am I going to do to minimize it? If that's done, then our work's going to be done well. It will be done safely and it will be done profitably. And so from a safety perspective, we believe that training, proper training, is one of the best leading safety indicators that we can have in our industry. If we are not yeah, training Gene, people, this is Mike. not being proactive. This is, this is Mike. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, Gene, I got a question for you on this. Uh, is, is this uh, a, a place where you would, uh, in your in training for your supervisors and field uh, lead folks, the letting them uh, potentially evaluate the the task at hand and making sure that they understand there may be four or five different ways to actually get a load move from point A to B, requiring a variety of different kinds of equipment. So, so. It, the more that they know about the use and capability of that equipment, um, they can make this decision to drive the risk down. Is that a benefit? Absolutely, it would be. Absolutely. The more they know about the tools and they're masters of their trade, masters of tools, they can uh, make, yeah, if they only know how to do one thing one way and they're in a position on a job site that that doesn't work, you just significantly increase the risk. But if they understand yeah. the tools, okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. You're okay. welcome. So we believe training, and that uh, is is probably our best leading indicator. And uh, actually, our branch managers have an expectation uh, to to constantly train and to be looking for not just the next field leader, but also how are they training the men that are maybe not going to be field leaders, but are just good workers. How they're 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 being held responsible to make sure they're trained. Okay, kind of enough of the philosophy of our discussion as to the why we're doing it. I think it's important to know what our goals are. Um, but who are these field leaders? Who, who are we looking at as the guys in the field that are leading our men? And let's just to go, I guess, go back to the basics. Uh, one, just the B30.5 and how it has defined responsibilities in the cranium rigging business. So obviously you have the five big ones, the owners, the users, the site supervisors, lift directors, and crane operators. But also uh, 1926 subpart CC um, defines some, some newer roles, AD director specifically, but also then operator, signal person, maintenance employee, and what we would claim in the rigor is not well defined at all. It is still mentioned. Um, I want to I highlight these, the, these five. These are the key positions that uh, we at Barnhart uh, consider our, our, our field leaders. And you could actually throw engineers into there, too, when they're out in the field. Um, but site supervisors, lift directors, uh, crane operators, AD directors, and, and riggers, we define those roles really as these. Um, typically, our superintendents um, are uh, act as uh, site supervisors sometimes, uh, not very often, but they're typically lift directors and they're running our crews. Uh, our foremen uh, are also field leaders and they're typically obviously riggers coming up in the end of the trade, you know, wanting to lead men. Our operators, AD director, uh, we do throw in project managers. Many times they're out in the field, particularly on large jobs, and they have some technical uh, background experience also. Risk managers and field engineers. Um, we believe that all of these roles, along with supportive management, are uh, crucial to a safe lifting operation. So these are uh, the, the roles that we're talking about. These are the, the people that we are interested in uh, training uh, in this presentation. So what are the skills that, that are needed in the field? What, what are the skills that we're looking for 
uh, to these individuals. One, they must be able to think and to do. Uh, this is, um, I'm going into much more detail on further slides. Second, they must be able to teach and replicate. Number three, they must be driven to serve. And four, they must be inclined to stay. Now, um, I'm going to each one of these, but this slide here I think is incredibly important uh, from the concept in that a field leader is more than just a person who's a technical expert uh, on the ground. Uh, obviously, they need to be, but um, by thinking and doing, they must be able to demonstrate the ability to observe important details in the chaotic landscape. Uh, we all know that in the field, things change constantly, and a leader must be at least a step ahead of his men, a step ahead of the work, and he's watching to know what to do and how to react. And so a key, a key there is observe. Uh, many, many people are very good technical technicians, but are they thinking ahead? Second, uh, obviously master of our work. Uh, they, mu they, must want, they must want to desire to, be ma to master the skill and the trade. So that from our perspective, heavy lift, heavy haul, and, and specialized rigging. Third, we want them to take initiatives to mitigate and address high-risk tasks on the jobs while following company policies and procedures. Uh, so we want to train based on our policies and procedures. These are the general guidelines. But when they're in the field and they're thinking and they're doing the right thing, we want them to, 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 to take initiatives that if a policy or procedure is not the best way, if it's not the safest way, just because it's written down on paper, in that particular case, it may not be the best, and so we have uh, we have a change a change of management procedure we want them to follow, which they can then interact with project management, salesmen, uh, engineers, uh, or the customer to change the plan, so they take the initiative, address the risk, and execute it well. Fourth, they have to be an effective communicator. Um, obviously, they have to communicate uh, well uh, with their men. They have to be able to lead them. Uh, and communicate usually orally, obviously, but sometimes in a written manner. Uh, we want them to be able to communicate well with customers. That reflects well on them. It reflects well on the crew. It reflects well on the company. And it can avoid uh, a significant number of uh, just challenges when field leaders are, are good communicators. And finally, obviously, in our business, uh, we want them to have mechanical aptitude. Obviously, they have to like what we do. Um, I'll come back to it in the, in, in, toward the end of the presentation, but one thing that we've really found is that many of our good field leaders um, you know, ask the question, we're hiring young men, what do you do as a hobby? What do you enjoy? And uh, we definitely find out that a lot of our guys in the field, um, they, they work on cars, they are outdoors, they are mechanically inclined, and so that, that does help. Okay, the second key aspect of um, a field leader is they must, be, they must uh, teach and replicate. And the key there is they must be willing to teach and train employees in the technical skills of the trade. They must desire the ability and to pass on information to the next person. Uh, and this whole idea of mentoring younger potential leaders in how to work and how to lead men uh, while at the same time getting the work done, executing it well, and, um, and serving the customer. We want them to demonstrate through their work and actions our values as a company. And these are uh, five of our uh, core values. Personal safety, quality service, innovation, continuous improvement, and uh, finally fairness. And so uh, that's just not fairness to the men, it's fairness to the customers, fairness to our, the, the owners of the company, it's fairness to themselves. And finally, um, Barnhart, I'm sorry, the key one here is the, they, they need to understand and really buy into the fact and value that replication is not synonymous with replacement. And so um, many times we've seen that if a, a skilled uh, field leader he may be very, very good at leading the guys and technically competent, but he's afraid that if he teaches somebody all the tricks that is younger, he may be replaced. 
What we're trying to encourage is that is absolutely not the case. That replication, if he, if he actually could duplicate himself, he's not losing his job and he's actually he's, he's making himself far, far more valuable uh, to his men and to the customer. And so this idea of uh, replication is not synonymous with replacement is, is, is huge. Finally, service. They need to, leaders, uh, we want them to serve those who, who are entrusted to their care. So other employees, uh, customers, other co-workers, and obviously uh, owners. We want the leaders to positively influence those in whom they have contact. Um, obviously, the, uh, the work we do is, is hard. Um, it's, it's not easy. Uh, stress can get up there, um, but yet uh, a field leader will deal with that and uh, come out on top. Uh, influence is not limited to direct authority or formal reporting structure. Uh, influence can be whatever that sphere is. And so we, we really believe that a field leader who is a good man in the field can definitely have influence uh, over project managers and over branch managers and, uh, and over engineers. Barnhart, as a company, uh, follows the, uh, a servant leader uh, model of leadership. If, if you have studied any type of leadership, that's, that, that's the model that we, we, we present, that we try to demonstrate as leaders, as we try to teach, and it, uh, it, it serves our men well. So finally, the fourth uh, skill that we've looked at is to stay. So we've gone through to think and to do, to teach and replicate, to serve, and finally, we want our men to be inclined to stay. Uh, we desire field leaders to find fulfillment and satisfaction in their daily work. Uh, we believe that uh, good, hard, honest work uh, is, is good, that uh, all men desire it, that it, it, it is good for us, and we want our men, uh, all, all employees in Barnhart, but field leaders uh, in particular in this conversation, to, to find the fulfillment in what they're doing. Uh, obviously then, to do that, they need to be dedicated and passionate about the work that we do. Uh, so the rigging and uh, lifting industry, um, we want them to be passionate about it, and to, we desire them to become experts in their field, and in that way they will stay. We want to provide and, re and receive recognition for the work that they skillfully execute. Um, that's actually hard to do sometimes, it really is, uh, particularly with the, the pace of, of industry. Now, that being said, these four key characteristics, we know that it's painting a very um, clear picture, but it's a very high bar, and we're definitely not um, trying to exclude uh, people. We, we realize that we can't find everyone like this. So we desire all field employees to have these traits. However, we also realize, though, that operators, riggers, mechanics, and drivers are able to succeed in their technical craft without them, but they're just not going to be necessarily field leaders. They may be highly skilled men in the field that they can be definitely relied on. There's a place for them, uh, but they're probably not going to be what we would classify as field leaders. Okay, moving on to the next point. So we went through kind of the philosophy of what we believe, who our field leaders are, the skills that we're looking for, and the, the, the high bar that uh, we have set. Uh, but how has um, ASME B30.5 and the, the new, well, I guess it's not so much new anymore, but OSHA regulations from uh, subpart CC 1926, they have impacted our recruitment. Okay? It, it definitely has a, 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 uh, an influence on us. So standard regulations um, have not had a direct impact. They haven't changed how we, we uh, the details of what we do. However, um, it has indirectly impacted us because it has influenced the caliber of our operators and riggers that we're looking for, um, what the men are capable of, of, of doing and their desire and what they want to do. It definitely impacts it. Um, I mean, at the end of 2000 and the next year, a year from now, uh, all operators are going to have to be third-party certified. Uh, we, as a company, typically use a CCO, uh, but we have 25 locations, and so we have state licenses and we have city certifications. Um, nonetheless, it does impact reading and comprehension skills, test taking skills, um, the, the fact that operators uh, may not like it at times, but they have to be willing to study 
uh, certain regulations and to keep up on uh, company policies and procedures. All the regulations that, uh, that go into training, it's not a one-time event, it's continuous. And um, to, uh, in reality, um, the, a lot of the operators, the older generation that um, are, are, are retiring, uh, we've had many or a few very, very excellent operators but had challenges passing um, the reading and uh, skill taking aspect of the CCO written exam. And unfortunately, um, those types of people are, are not going, even though they could be excellent operators, they're going to have to uh, pass these tests. So the regulations are impacting uh, the men that we can look at. Secondly, uh, it, it, a lot of these regulations are forcing the field employees to be multi-skilled, multitasking sometimes. Um, I mean, operators who can be 80 directors. Uh, so you may have uh, on a large heavy lift crane, a super lift, um, the operator may be operator crane one day, and he could be an 80 director on another crane the next day. Operators who can rig and want to rig, they're not just sitting in the seat. They're, they have... Uh, even if they don't drive, uh, if they're not driving a mobile crane, they still may have a commercial driver's license and so they can drive a commercial vehicle. And then riggers who can drive a commercial vehicles and some who are willing to get a CCO license so they can run pickers and to run smaller cranes. So it's forcing the field uh, to, to expand their horizons. Um, we think in general this is good because uh, the more skills that uh, people have and the more opportunities they have, well, we, we think it's good. Okay, um, other aspects that uh, B35 and uh, B30.5, excuse me, in 1926 of impact recruitment, it's the time and energy that we have to put into finding these leaders uh, to make sure that uh, and train them in compliance with the regulations and standards. Um, it, it really forces us as a business to minimize the number of employees we hire that we, we're pretty sure are not going to be uh, the right fit on the bus. And so be becoming much more, uh, I would say, discriminating in how we look. It's impacting it. Another one is uh, business demands has forced us to become very proactive and deliberate in recruiting. Uh, it's a, we have people who are full-time doing this, and it is a very, very deliberate action. And then for us, finding properly skilled people who are either certified or qualified is becoming more difficult. Uh, I don't know if anyone else is seeing this. He was listening to my voice, but uh, we're finding it true. I want to read this quote. This is actually from um, Mike Rowe, who's the host of Dirty Jobs. I uh, found this in an article uh, earlier in the year. So testifying before the U.S. Senate last year, Mike Rowe, the rugged host of television Dirty Jobs, said nearly a half million trade jobs are out there for the taking across the United States. That sets up a huge dichotomy in the struggling economy. People can't find jobs, and yet, Good jobs can't be found by qualified people. We're surprised that high unemployment can exist at the same time as a skilled labor shortage. We shouldn't be. We've pretty much guaranteed it. Many baby boomer tradesmen are getting set to hang out their tools, and not enough young people are stepping into these trades to replace them. So we're, we're definitely seeing this. We're seeing this challenge. Uh, we're, we're finding it uh, more difficult to find people who want to go into the business and get out in the field. And uh, that pool is getting smaller of even those then that want to be or are able to be leaders. Okay, so how do we find them then? What, what's the pipeline of these people? How do we find them? Well, uh, first, um, obviously a company has to be growing, uh, or at least looking for people. So growth provides a context where conversations about looking for people can occur. And so if a company is growing, um, just looking at people on the inside, um, PDPs, professional development plans, can be very strategic. We found them very good for uh, finding people that have um, potential abilities, and then we select them for key roles and give them opportunities for deliberate growth, uh, give them specific uh, training goals on an annual basis, and then the training or uh, hands-on, on-the-job training to fill uh, those skill gaps. And then uh, finally, uh, give people real responsibility. Um, if we think someone has the potential uh, to grow into a role, is to truly give them responsibility, uh, set them up for success, uh, but also give them the opportunity uh, to, to fail. 
Second, we go through assessments. Uh, we we uh, look at multiple levels of assessments, looking at people both internally and externally of the company. Uh, we, we have used the ASVAB. Uh, this is the Armed Service Vocational Aptitude uh, Battery. There are um, the military developed these. They're out there. The tests are, are, are available. The assessments and how to analyze them are, are, are not. We've had to develop our own. But it's a good cursory view um, if someone has the aptitudes we're looking for. Uh, we use an attribute assessment from the Divine Company to see if uh, a person has, based on a series of questions that are asked, are they a good, a good fit? Do they think that based on what we know about a, a role and a job, are they gonna, is it worth the investment? Or do we think they're going to they're, they're gonna fill that role? And then finally, um, we found some useful is the DISC. It's a personality assessment. Uh, particularly as people step into uh, leadership roles, learning how to deal with different types of personalities is, is important. Then our interview process. Um, it's a multi-level process. Uh, we do have um, phone interviews for first time. These are planned strategic questions that are asked. Um, we look at a lot of questions for a first time operator or someone who's new to the field. Uh, just very general questions. It could be as simple as, do you change your own oil in your vehicle? Uh, if the answer is no, then it may raise into doubt their mechanical desire or, or aptitude. Um, we do uh, site visits and face-to-face -face meetings. Well, will they fit into our culture? Do they fit into the branch they're going to be fitting into? And then um, multiple people look into this. It is a hiring manager's decision, but uh, multiple uh, inputs is, is crucial uh, for making a good choice. Uh, where do we not find them? Um, we, we do find some from local uh, local unions, um, but in general, in general, um, we're finding that um, across the nation, the unions are struggling in, in developing um, uh, potential field leaders. They're out there, and we definitely do employ them, but we are not relying on the halls uh, to provide us those skills. And nor do we use headhunting. Um, it's a business decision not to use that. Uh, we think it's better to find people and to grow them uh, internally and find the right people ourselves. So what we're looking for are really people that fit um, the book by Good to Great from Jim Collins. Do they share the organizational core values? <laughs> they do what they say they're going to do. They have a passion for our work. They have they, they look at they have responsibilities and not just a job. They're looking for uh, roles and responsibilities. They're self-managed and they're self-motivated and they have a window and mirror maturity. If you haven't uh, heard that before, it's, it's a great picture that if a, a, a leader, if a person, if something is going well and the team has done well, he's looking through the window, looking at everyone uh, that was involved in that. If something did not go as planned uh, or as well as we desired, then it's a mirror. And as a leader, he's looking at himself and uh, wondering then how he could have connected. So that's kind of... Um, that aspect of it, but then, so where do we find them? Uh, this is our pipeline. We really have three areas that we have developed, um, and we call them entry-level positions. The second one is homegrown tomatoes, and then the third is the proven commodities, and so looking in the marketplace. I'm going to go into these entry-level positions. So these will be the people coming in who are brand new, not only to Barnhart, but new to the industry. Um, and they're learning from the ground up. We, we started this by actually um, listing it on our website. Uh, we do not have any direct advertisement in local newspapers or trade journals uh, for entry-level positions. And this by mean, I mean uh, entry levels as far as operators, fabricators, maintenance, dispatch, uh, wind workers. The, it is entry level. Uh, the entry level pay is roughly uh, $15 an hour. Um, we, we want them to be a desire to come into a highly educational environment. We tell them that they're going to learn multiple skills and crafts. Uh, they're going to be traveling a lot. You know, we, we promise them that they're not going to be in the same place very long. We promise them they're going to work a lot of long hours and they're going to be outside. And so for many, many people that come to our website, that uh, eliminates them. We also ask for a two-year commitment in training. Now, uh, what have we found? Uh, we've been doing this for 18 months, and we call it our lifting and transportation training position. 
we've had over 1,500 applications online uh, for these entry-level positions. Um, it is a when they apply online, it's really a basic 24 uh, experience questions, and they're very general, such as um, do you change your own oil? Uh, were you in, uh, involved in the Boy Scouts? Uh, were, did, were you involved on team sports? Um, were you in the military? Uh, have you uh, graduated from high school? Have you graduated from college? And so basic questions that we have learned to filter things down. So of the 1,500, roughly a quarter of those passed the online screening questions. So 75% don't even make through the basic questions. Uh, of that 25%, less than 15 then actually had an initial phone interview, uh, either because they didn't follow up or they just didn't respond to the interview. Uh, of the roughly um, 17 to 700 people that uh, or so that we interviewed, less than 100 passed for a second interview. Uh, of the 100, 50 out of 1,500 were suitable, uh, we thought, for a job offer. And of those 50, uh, 22 have been hired, and uh, over that 18 month, uh, we've had four left. Four have left the company for multiple reasons. And so for this entry level position, uh, where we promise they're going to travel, they're going to learn, but they're going to be pushed, uh, we've had an 80% retainage rate. So we've had 18 people successfully uh, get involved in the company out of 1,500 applications. That's a lot of phishing. It's just a, a broad net sweep. Uh, but we're seeing the benefits of that. It's of all the people looking online, particularly the younger generation that searches online, we're seeing some really, really good benefits. And the 18 that we have hired uh, are, are exceptional. Um, I actually have one working for me after uh, eight months in the field. He proved himself. And uh, so we're very, very good results for that. Let me go into point number two and three, our second and third kind of our homegrown tomatoes and our proven commodities. Our homegrown tomatoes are really uh, internal. Um, they're people that are already in, 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 the, in the company. We've already grown them up. They've been proven. And we give them um, provided continuous on-the-job training. This is a majority of our guys. These are the guys that are proving themselves. Uh, they're the ones growing and working in the company. Um, they're selected for specific key roles for growth. Uh, we, we give them in specific training and goals to fill their gaps. And we do, as I mentioned before, we try to give them real responsibility so they have the opportunities to succeed, but they also have the opportunity to fail. And uh, you can't have one without the other. And that is proven well. The final is a proven commodities. That's just a term that we're using um, for experienced people, though, that are outside of our industry. Uh, we primarily are looking at this for project managers, branch managers, regional directors. Uh, these are not typically people uh, that grew up in the trades and in, in the field. Uh, what we found, though, is that uh, they do bring new ideas and energy to the business. Um, because they have proven themselves in other industries, they really can start working immediately and bring value where they can. Okay, and, as, and as they learn, it is a high-risk venture. And it's high risk on both parts. Uh, the company takes a higher risk because you're bringing somebody in and you have to train them while they are managing and while they're working. It's a high risk for the individual because if it doesn't work, um, then uh, they, they have to move on to something else. But uh, with high risk, there is high reward, and we have had uh, great success with this. So all three of these avenues, though, require a significant amount of time to go through. Nothing is easy. Uh, nothing is fast about finding these people or, or, or training them and getting them in positions. Okay, so that's how, that's how we find the people. That's the main means of how we find them. So what are the qualifications we're looking for? How do we qualify these field leaders? We are, uh, Barnhart is a uh, ISO 9001 uh, company. We are a, uh, we value quality. And the way that we qualify our employees stems from our process. Uh, we use a series of standard operating procedures that we have uh, developed for operating our tools. And we have a series of qual cards, as we call. These are kind of the qualification certificates that, the, uh, that all of us have as we become qualified to operate equipment. SOP, as we define them, are uh, is how we operate a specific piece of equipment or a tool. 
it's how it's utilized in the field. These are our best practices. And with that, our qual cards are designed to ensure that our men are qualified to safely and competent, excuse me, competently operate our equipment. So in the case of an operator, um, our operators will be qualified by us. They're certified by a third party, whether it's state, uh, licensed, or uh, CIA, or uh, CCO. But we will qualify the men on a specific unit. And in many cases, it's not just a unit. It could be the configuration of the unit. So if it's a large 600-ton hydro, we may have an operator who's qualified just to run at main boom, or someone else is qualified to operate it in luffer and superlift mode. Each of our qual cards uh, is comprised of both a knowledge section and an experience section. Uh, both of these sections have to be signed off by a qualified trainer and the branch manager before uh, that person is able to operate that piece of equipment um, essentially independently out in the field. And currently, we as a company, we have 70 of these unique qual cards. I have an example here of a, a, a type of qual card. Uh, this happens to be for uh, the AED director, uh, the new role uh, under 1926 law. If you notice here, the three, that's the top three, they have to read and understand the AED essentially assembly, assembly disassembly of cranes, booms, and jibs in our SOP. Uh, so they have to read our SOP and they have to demonstrate that understanding, uh, that they understand the responsibility of the AD director, and uh, they know how to use our AD director JHA. So very, very specific. Uh, each person who's qualified as AD director has to go through this, and it's crane specific. This kind of gives you an example of the detail that we require our men to go through to get signed off. And uh, this, this, this has worked well. We've been doing this now for uh, qual cards almost 10 years, and it continues to grow and to be refined. Um, so going on to the AD director um, position as an example, um, as, a, as a leader, they have to be experienced in crane operations, obviously, typically an operator, but at the same time, uh, experienced in the AD director of the crane and configuration, and they have to demonstrate uh, the proper AD director and assembly assembly in the field multiple times. They've read and demonstrated um, the understanding of the crane operator's manual. Okay, they've read and demonstrated understanding of our AD director SOP. The qual card has been signed by a qualified trainer, and that qual card is then signed by the branch manager. And the signed qual card is scanned, saved, and then it's turned into our online documentation system and training management system for, 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 for records. And then uh, our direct, our, any of our call cards, any of our um, people could be audited in the field or evaluated in the field at, at any given time. And so that brings accountability uh, to the training after a, a person is trained. Okay, so finally, what are the training needs of, of our leaders? Um, what, what, what do they need and in, in, uh, how are we trying to fulfill those? Probably the most important for us is on-the-job training. Um, we, we, we take this very seriously. We think that really the only way to really, really learn uh, how to lead men and to do our work well is in the field. Uh, it can be helped by the PDP, that's the Annual Professional Development Plan that their branch manager or supervisor will, will help them through, deliberately give them job responsibilities, and then uh, through that try to continually increase their levels of responsibility and accountability. We have something called Barnhart University. Uh, this is an online training system that happens weekly. It's every Thursday at uh, 4 p.m. Central Time. It is uh, for bar all Barnhart employees. It's recorded. It can range anywhere from sales to operations to new tools to um, post-job reviews or highlights of jobs uh, to Alan Barnhart actually gives a monthly update on the company. But it's a viewable to everybody. It can be viewed live or um, via the Internet from any computer. So we have men that travel, obviously. Uh, they have their own computer or a computer in a hotel. They can bring it up. And it provides a broader uh, scope of training. Finally, on a, an annual basis, and we have a field leadership conference. It's an annual event that we bring in uh, current field leaders or potential field leaders, and we focus on leadership and application of leadership in the field. We also focus on specific tools that we may have, new tools that were developed or purchased, uh, issues that we've had in the company over the year. Uh, we want to then roll out to the field. It will be rolled out there. And then uh, we have specific 
uh, targeted training using the Barnhart Training Center. And like Zach mentioned, uh, we have partnered with ITI in our Memphis facility. This is a picture of it, both uh, outside and inside. We have a dedicated little AT there, and uh, then uh, specialized rigging tools. It is uh, proven to be to be uh, very, very um, profitable and very, very useful uh, to give people the experience they need in all aspects of, of rigging and in how to use our, 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 our tools. This is kind of a list of uh, the training that we currently have, uh, anywhere from crane operators to, which is a three-day event, to something very short, uh, signal person training, uh, to heavy machining moving and basic forklift, um, basic rigger. We have a, a dream and rigger class. Uh, we have chosen to develop these internally ourselves. Um, we have over 420-some lines of goal hoppers, so we have THP, PST, PSTE training, and it goes on. And so as we develop tools, we continue then to develop the training. Finally, I want to just wrap up and kind of try to sum all this together. Um, we believe that our work is safe when we're properly managing the risk of the job. Um, like moving that 1,600-ton uh, uh, electrostatic precipitator you see there, um, big, heavy, good work. Um, but managing the risk is key. And training is one of our best leading indicators of are, are we being safe. If we're training our men, it's an indication that we're probably heading in the right direction. Before we can train, though, we have to find the right people. And so recruiting good employees requires time and a deliberate process. It's not going to happen by chance. It doesn't happen randomly. You may get lucky, um, but it's not going to be consistent. And so then finding and training those field leaders is a continuous job that demands focus and diligence by the company, by the individual, and um, the individual must take responsibility for his own, uh, his own career. Standards and regulations are influencing, influencing the required skills of the trainers and our employees. They are impacting it. Uh, higher bar is requiring us to find uh, many times more competent people. And finally, companies or industry uh, must have a process in place to ensure the quality and training of the field leaders, uh, particularly if we're going to find uh, the people to fit into uh, our, our, our roles in the future to replace us. Uh, we've got to train them. We've got to find them. I want to just summarize by Randy Lewis. He's a senior vice president of branch operations, and I love this quote, our business is not inherently dangerous, but it is unforgiving. And so with that, I'll close. And so, Zach, if we want to, if any questions, I'll be glad to address those. Yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. I, I hear the crowd going wild. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Uh, let me, what I'm going to do is, uh, everyone, I'm going to pass over the control of the screen or the sharing to Mike, who's going to kind of uh, annotate for us here. And uh, w I want to feed some uh, the pre-registration questions to uh, Gene here that uh, some of you folks had. So uh, Pam from Kimberly Clark asked, how do you tackle the challenge of selecting a lift director when you have limited skills within your organization? Mm, that's a good question. The, the role of lift director is defined uh, by ASME, and um, the lift director really is responsible for the safe execution of uh, the lifting. So they're responsible for essentially the crane operating well, uh, the riggers doing their job well, and uh, that the flat, the six, excuse me, the load is being signaled properly. So if you do not have somebody um, who is qualified to do that, um, either I would contact the um, get one trained, contact a local hall, or possibly uh, if uh, the company that you're working for, they may have a a competent lift director uh, who can fill in. Uh, Mike, you anything to add there? Yeah, I would. Um, some things that we've noticed in the, over time is <clears throat> a bit on um, the lift directors. It, we they can be trained up. One is to understand the responsibilities, as uh, Gene noted in B30.5, Chapter Three. There uh, contains a pretty good run-on description, but uh, they really need to be cross-trained. In uh, and I'm just going to use uh, three, like a three-leg milk stool. But in the LHE, which is the load handling equipment, they need to understand. They don't have to be an operator per se, but they need to understand its configurations, its abilities, capabilities, and the things not to do with it. Um, they need to be uh, very well uh, uh, ingrained with rigging. Um, 
in the in the advanced and master rigger and understand good uh, inspection processes when to reject rigging as necessary on the job site, particularly for critical lift activities. But the uh, practice of rigging, the methodology of approved methods uh, by the manufacturers, um, and um, the, the practices uh, has been adopted by the industry that are are um, qualified over time. These will get the job done, always respecting the weight and the center of gravity. And the third third item for a lift director sort of to raise him up, as Gene noted, is to understand the process of the organization, the 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 not only the safety practices but the the means and methods that the organization has, and that may actually take some development requirement within the organization if it doesn't already exist. But he, he's got to be sort of the answer person on site to make the call, make the decision, and he needs to fully understand what are our accepted means and methods within our company, staying within OSHA, staying with our corporate guidelines, are we using the equipment properly, and are we tackling the load properly? So. The lift director needs kind of a broad base uh, training and skill set uh, to really serve. He doesn't have to be the super master in any of them. Uh, as far as LHEs and rigging, he really does need to understand the process, uh, means, and methods. But he's the, he's the person that manages those folks that are specialists in their particular field, but he's got to run the choo-choo train. So um, it is trainable. Um, and. Uh, We've outlined on a number of uh, previous webinars some of the things that are important for a lift director and how to get there. And th this is the baby steps and the starting points uh, for how to achieve that. But we really appreciate the question very much. And th this is sort of our layout and game plan as to how to create a lift director. Terrific. All right. Well, um, I just want to let everyone know, too, I had a bunch of questions come in during. If you have any questions, make sure you uh, we didn't have a slide to explain this, but make sure you type them into the questions block. Um, but we have another question come in from Ryan from uh, Northern Tier Energy. What uh, criteria make a lift critical, and what criteria should trigger a former, I'm sorry, a formal critical lift plan requiring a PE to prepare it? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, actually, I know, uh, Mike, you're actually on the ASME P30 committee who's dealing with this, so you're probably the best person to answer. Yeah, um, well, thanks. The, uh, the critical lift plan um, is uh, currently under uh, development for ASMA P30. And um, what we've done is outlined there are about uh, nine, nine primary uh, segments that can trigger a, uh, uh, oh, you might say a, a consideration point for, for critical lift planning. Some of those that rise quickly to the top are we'll call them man basket lifts, um, uh, power line or energized lines, when we have the general public uh, immediately at risk, and uh, which might be flying loads over uh, highways, byways, or it could be um, hazardous chemicals uh, that can be released in the air, uh, maybe not just on the ground, but airborne. So all of a sudden, um, those things start to there is a list, and if the email us, I can at least share the, the bullet point list with it. It's not in publication yet, but we can give you some traction as to what we're what we're offering to the public as sort of our big our big hit list uh, for critical lift plan consideration. And uh, you know, Gene, um, you guys, uh, Barnard has a very uh, large. Uh, a fleet of professional engineers within your organization. I think the other side of this, um, and ITI, our company, is not an engineering firm, and uh, we get involved with the getting questions from folks that, uh, can you guys uh, help us out with a particular lift? And if it's about process means or methods, a lot of times we can offer some advisement on, on methodology uh, or review some plan for just the people and the, the use of the equipment and so on. But quite often, I even got a call yesterday uh, out of Seattle for some work up in Vancouver, BC, that really the only real answer is a professional engineer needed to do some evaluation. And Barnhart's really good at that. Um, maybe you can explain where, where uh, the, the, the value and benefit of having a professional engineer, engineer directly involved in the pre-planning and execution might be of most benefit. Sure. We, we do employ several, uh, many PEs that are licensed across many states. Um, I will say this, that um, a lot of 
the requirements of a PE stamp uh, come from our customers because they're, they're concerned and they want, they want just a better level of security. They want to know that it was reviewed and um, particularly if it's a dual crane pick, uh, particularly if we're approaching a, a part of the crane or the chart. Some customers um, have different levels, you know, whether it's 80% of capacity uh, or 100% you know, of capacity, of which we're, uh, we, we will lift at 100% of capacity uh, but obviously that's a critical lift. And so our customers really drive it. Um, as far as the the need for that, they're really we we very rarely say in a given situation this must be stamped. Um, as the, the risk goes up on a job, obviously the review increases and uh, but it's our customers that are really driven uh, requiring us uh, per PE stamps. Uh, some customers now requiring every single lift that we do to be PE stamped. Uh, some refineries we work in, the DOE that we work for, every lift has to be stamped. Every lift must be designed. So there are, there are many, many extremes out there. There really isn't uh, a one-size-fits-all for PEs. Okay. Good question, Zach. Let's go ahead with the next one for Gene. Okay. Yeah, Nate uh, from Crane Industry Services asked, does Barnhart accept certification from any other certifying agencies like NCCER or CIC? Yes, we do. Yeah, we do. We, we just chosen as a company uh, that if we're going to train somebody, they're going to go through CCO. But yeah, we will accept others. So I guess when you're, Gene, when you're hiring somebody from the field, for instance, like you were saying, you, if they have a CIC cert or a NCCER cert, you'll, you'll utilize Absolutely. that. That's right, yeah. just as long as they're nationally accredited. You know, what would happen, though, is if we did have an operator that came in and uh, he was under uh, another certification agency, we, we would not necessarily send him back to be recertified through that agency. We would go through CCO. Sure. Yep. Okay, awesome. Uh, Robert Phillips asked, um, for a routine non-critical lift where there's not a uh, designated lift director, for instance, just a crane operator, um, or even a hired crane operator from a rental crane company, and a couple riggers, and I'm paraphrasing this, but who he asks, who becomes the default lift director? This comes up often uh, on routine minor lifts that result in accidents. That's a really, really good question. Um, we uh, we do roughly 10,000 jobs a year uh, nationwide, and a significant number of those. I don't have a. Um, it's definitely close to 10, 20, 30 percent of those are um, a situation we have one crane and one or two people. Um, when we have a taxi cab rental, so a small crane rental for a light industrial or a commercial job, uh, it is the, the our contract and our job ticket. We we clearly state that we only assume the role of crane owner and crane operator, and if uh, it's up to the we, uh, the client, our, our customer, to provide, they assume the role of lift director, site supervisor, and now uh, with 19, uh, 1926, uh, they have to supply a certified signal person, uh, or else we'll be glad to, but we're going to charge them for that. And so we put the responsibility back on uh, the, the customer. If they don't have somebody, uh, then obviously we will, we will provide that. Uh, but it's a really good question and it's a challenge for our operators. Um, the way that it really um, boils down is when our operators show up on a job site and uh, they're being flagged by somebody a significant number of times, that person is not a qualified signal person and our operators have to be very careful. They have to watch the rigging, they will stop the lift, they will, they will question the rigging, and um, so they're not responsible legally, but our operators are obviously watching and will stop the job if they have to. But uh, that's a really, really good question. I think it's an issue in the industry in general that everyone who operates a crane deals with. Interesting. Gene, if I can add, I think that, um, that we'll probably eventually see um, – some of this actually flesh out in court. There will be some days and places and ways that uh, folks are going to end up with a combined group and unless the contractor makes it explicitly uh, clear to the client that we need, you guys have decided the, the scope of work, the lifting to be done, and we're, 
we're here to provide the operator side and the rigging side, but you're assuming the resp resp responsibility of lift director. Um, if they haven't made that clear, uh, it, the courts will probably decide it on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think it's really in, incumbent on um, the client to get more sophisticated about what they have to have done and providing the right personnel and then then filling in that the uh, qualified operator with the right machine, with the right riggers, and uh, helping oversee that because it is their property, it is their equipment as a general rule. And um, I, I would hope that the courts, uh, you know, will come to the realization that uh, unless it's a contracted service and they've asked Barnhart or someone else to, to completely serve uh, for as lift director services and completely man and run the entire job, um, these these you can't jump across the creek halfway. And the the client the client really is the responsible party. They own the property. They're the controlling entity. So uh, I just don't think it's fair to to pawn off the lift director role and responsibilities onto a taxi operator and a couple of riggers. I don't think that's I mean that's not that's not their training. I mean you, we just went through a whole session on training and and as a general rule they're they're they may not have been trained within anybody's organizational uh, effort as lift directors that's right so I think that the clients have to get more sophisticated about we're we're we own this and and we need to have somebody that that is competent either in-house or we're going to need to pay for it one way or the other Yeah, and Robert had another follow-up question while you guys were chatting about it. He basically said, what happens when the current operator refuses the lift and gets booted from the site, basically in the absence of a qualified uh, client lift director? Um, I'm okay with that. Um, it, it causes challenges commercially, obviously. Uh, you have a disappointed customer. Um, but uh, we, we empower our operators, particularly when... It's a taxi cab rental, and you have one or two guys out there. Let's say you have three. You may have an operator, an oiler, and another rigger. And um, if the customer particularly has told us, yes, we'll have a qualified signal person out there, and we'll have a lift director, but if the, if the operator is not comfortable the way that the material is being rigged, if the operator is not comf custom comfortable with the, with the ground conditions, if the operator is not comf uh, comf comfortable with what they're being asked to do, we have entirely empowered them. They can walk away, and uh, we have policies and procedures in places to to help minimize that that impact. But I would much rather have a operator who is competent and says this is not good, and he walks away, as opposed to then an operator trying to please a customer, and we have uh, dam injured person, damaged equipment, damaged uh, customer property. Um, because inevitably it will come back on us if we lift it. Yeah. And, and Gene, just to be fair, this is not a, just a Barnhart position. Uh, wouldn't you say uh, you guys are a strong members of SCNRA, Specialized Carriers and Rigging Association? As a general rule, the the real professionals in the industry uh, likely have very much the same attitude. Wouldn't you think? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, Gene, Zach, come another down, question. Like yeah, no, I was going to add it, Gene. It all comes down right to your. I like how you said how you empower the crane operators. It comes down to having suitably trained them to make those decisions as well. So it just gets back to the root cause of training those leaders. So yeah, in reality, the way it actually happens is very rarely will a customer kick a crane off the job because it's just too expensive. But what they'll do is they'll really pressure the operator, and the operator has to know when to call the salesman or project manager, and let let the uh, salesman, project manager, branch manager deal with the commercial aspects and with the clarification of what the responsibilities are and let the operator be uh, an expert in the field. So at that point, to me, the operator made the right call. He deferred to someone else's skill and um, it, it seems to work well. To be honest with you, we've had very, very few situations where that was not solvable. Yeah, we're good. Well, that, that's it for questions besides one gentleman asked, how can I join Barnhart U? Um, <laughs> have to be an employee. Apply for a job at Barnhart, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Well, with that, you guys, I just want to uh, thank you personally, Gene, very much for coming on behalf of Barnhart and taking your time out. This was 
just awesome, and uh, I'm sure the uh, I'll be getting a lot of feedback and have already gotten great feedback from folks. So I just want to thank everyone for coming, and uh, Gene, I'll leave it with you to close off. Do you have anything else to say? No, thank you very much, uh, ITI, and uh, Mike and Zach, for the invitation. Enjoy uh, relationship working with you guys and just making the industry better. Thank you much. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody. Okay, and, uh, as a closing, uh, Zach, if I could have uh, as a closing question to you, we are actually our uh, um, Gene and I want to th thank you so much for the uh, presentation. It was very well done, and I picked up a number of small uh, nuggets right in the field right there as you went right through it. It's surprising. Uh, we do a lot of gap identification for our trainers, consultants that work for us, and. We, we look for those opportunities. Where can we get this guy trained up in these specific module items or subjects? And um, and then continuing assessing uh, performance. So, um, I, you know, I, I really appreciate what you said. And 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 it, it's it's one thing. Not all people are natural leaders, and sometimes you can develop them to be you know skilled, trained leaders, and they will uh, blossom as a result right. of it. So that's right. Your efforts are uh, you know dead on. So. Zach, I wanted to bring up one important thing um, for our, our listeners. The, we have another uh, uh, webinar that's very close. We, the, the November, December uh, webinar series is actually just the December one's right around the corner. Do you have the date for that and the subject? Yeah. Yeah, it's actually next week on Tuesday. There's already about 100 people registered for it. Uh, it's, uh, we're actually having another guest speaker come on from Hague Engineering, uh, Jim uh, Wheathorn, Wheathorn, right? I'm sorry. Yep, Jim Wheathorn. Jim. And he's basically doing a, a they, Hag Engineering is a forensics uh, company and they've, he's put together an awesome presentation on how studies of crane accidents and trends lead to a safer work environment. So it's a lot of data that they've uh, basically accumulated over the years and uh, how they're using it to consult with people making a better work environment. So that's next Tuesday, December 4th, and then the, We'll have another one in January, of course, um, pretty much 40 days later. So there'll be plenty of time to thread the word on that one. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Zach. I appreciate that. Go ahead and close out, and we appreciate everybody attending today. Yep, thank you, everybody. The presentation will be available on the website, and uh, the actual file that uh, Gene was going through will be as well. So it's awesome. Please send out a thank you to Barnhart and uh, – Hire them for your next job because that is great information um, for you to have internally, just that presentation that Gene put together. So uh, 